it's a pleasure to be back here at FSU. And um, as I said, don't hold my Gator credentials against me. I've enjoyed my time here at FSU and in Tallahassee on my previous visits, and this one has been no different so far. Thanks for coming out to hear uh, the presentation I'm going to give this morning, as well as those of my colleagues. I, I hope that we have a rich discussion. Uh, as Martin mentioned, this is a very timely moment for us to sort of engage with these issues of uh, U.S. American occupation in the Caribbean, and I hope to try and uh, make my contribution to that discussion with a presentation on Haiti, kind of going back to the actual beginnings of, uh, of the, um, this period of occupation. If it began at any other time than the summer of 1915, the United States occupation of Haiti would have still been bitterly controversial. Some had predicted it for years. Since at least 1902, Haitian politicians and their revolutionary opponents promulgated their right to rule on the very basis that they would prevent Haiti from U.S. occupation. Those who closely observed the political situation from outside thought occupation inevitable. The precarious state of Haitian governance and the presence of United States troops in nearby Cuba gave reason for this view. For Haitian nationalists, the possibility of U.S. occupation brought fear. One president, Noah Alexei, went so far as to vow that he would blow up the National Palace and himself in it with the Americans set foot on Haitian soil. It was more than nationalism. In fact, this view was to protect that one part of Haitian identity that was deemed beyond negotiation, the country's long independence. The spiral that followed the overthrow of Alexei in 1908 cemented the thought in the minds of critics and supporters that it was no longer a question of if the United States would invade or not, it was a question of when. In the six and a half years that followed, the U.S. presence increased dramatically in finance and diplomacy, and to such a degree that it seemed as if the preparatory work for intervention was being laid at a rapid pace. Just as quick was the deterioration in the Haitian political scene. When President Vilbon Guillaume Sam ordered the assassination of over 160 mostly elite political rivals in the National Penitentiary in July 1915, an act without precedent in the country's history, he had widened the potential for occupation. His own mutilation at the hands of a vengeful mob of relatives made it real. These violent episodes were the precipitates and action that had been taking shape long before. These points, the build-up of U.S. invasion and the trajectory of Haitian politics, were commented on by Haiti's closest neighbors in the Caribbean. For many of these islands, their connections with Haiti were multiple and knotted with stronger links found in Cuba, and as I've shown elsewhere, in Jamaica. Thus the circumstances that led to military intervention were deeply felt and considered. A Jamaican editorial, written just after news of Guillaume Sam's execution, brought all of recent history to bear. I'm going to quote from the editorial, quote, But the fact that has to be faced is that during the last six or seven years, Haiti has been speeding along the downward path with more terrible rapidity than ever before. Instead of improving, she has been going from worse to worse. Something has to be done to put an end to all this disgraceful conduct. And we suspect that America will be heard from within the next few days." End quote. It is worth pondering this comment further. The response here is impassioned. It indicates more than a passing awareness of the state of Haiti. Far too often, a view that Haiti had been up until 1915 isolated from the region and the rest of the world for that matter, gets undue repetition. This editorial remark lays out a clear sense of events in Haiti over the course of the half a dozen years that preceded the occupation. Haitians had since the mid-19th century been making Jamaica a second home, a place of refuge during political crises. Guillaume Sam himself and a dozen of his predecessors had at one time or another lived in Kingston. So the comment comes from a place of intimate knowledge of the charged field of Haitian politics. But there is another element of the statement that is, however, more pertinent to us this morning. The sense of disappointment that Haiti was unable to solve its problems itself. The disgraceful conduct in the line resonates strongly. Elsewhere, the editorial develops this point. Quote, but we do know that all Jamaica will be horror-struck 
at this latest evidence of savagery displaced by a class of men who presume to pose as leaders of the Haitian Republic. We want to see as few as possible of that type of Haitian here." End quote. Another Jamaican writer of the same period, writing in another newspaper the same week of Guillaume Sam's murder, would use the words that Haiti was, quote, breaking the hearts of those who love her, end quote, and by this include people like himself. Given the vigor of these commentaries, it would be expected that the initial response to the arrival of U.S. Admiral Caperton in Port-au-Prince in July 1915 by observers in Haiti, Jamaica, and elsewhere in the region would be one of embrace. But the response was more complicated than that. Opinion on the best political course for Haiti had oscillated for decades. Where some may have welcomed foreign occupation to put an immediate end to the cycle of revolutions, more acute in the period after 1908, and to lead Haiti closer to what was loosely termed civilization, others lamented that foreign occupation would, would mean an end to Haitian independence. This point is especially important for Haiti's colonial neighbors, regardless of class or color affiliation, had always debated the importance of Haiti's independence, seen as either a model or an admonition for them. Those who dreamt of an autonomous Caribbean clutched tightly to, to the Haitian example, explaining its political disorders as externally motivated attempts to undermine a proud Caribbean nation. The occupation punctured that vision. Just a few months after the occupation began, a public lecture on Haitian history held in Kingston referred to the period 1804 to 1915 as, quote, the great experiment of Haitian independence. The implication is obvious. The U.S. occupation was viewed as permanent and Haitian independence as past. In my contribution to the discussion on American occupations today, I want to explore the career of opposing views of the U.S. occupation of Haiti. My focus would be less on Haitian or U.S. responses and reactions to occupation. Rather, I want to discuss occupation as it was viewed from within the Caribbean. The context for this examination, as I have just outlined, is a general regard for Haiti's relevance to the wider region. In the 19th century, debates about Haiti centered around fear of influence on the slavery and post-emancipation societies of its neighbors. By the early 20th century, Caribbean debates about Haiti were framed in terms of independence, sovereignty, and imperialism. My focus is principally on the English-speaking islands and more particularly on Jamaica. Across the years of occupation, the English-speaking Caribbean questioned its own relationship to two empires, the ancient British one it belonged to and the burgeoning one from the north that had rather quickly enveloped its neighbors in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Panama, later the Dominican Republic, and of course Haiti. The contrasting perspectives on the U.S. occupation of Haiti that were held in Jamaica were therefore not only reflective of how commenters saw Haiti, but also how they saw themselves. Let us for the moment return to 1915. Opinions on the outcome of the U.S. arrival in Haiti were tied to the events that led to it. The rhetorical thrust of U.S. officials was that it was intended for the restoration of order in Haiti. But how long would such a process take? What would it involve? The structure of Haitian politics, which had relied so long on regional power brokers, foreign capitalists, and authoritarian rule, would have to be dissolved. But what would emerge in its place? The most hopeful among the groups that welcomed occupation vainly wished that a democratic culture could be inculcated with Haitian political elites in charge. Others had held for years that the U.S. occupation would mean a return to slavery. This was not just, as one American later stated, the usual cry of ignorant Haitians. It was more a fearful reading of news of Jim Crow segregation, lynching, and racial abuse in the United States, which had been publicized in Haiti as well as across the Caribbean. If not slavery, then a form of racial repression. Another view of the promise of occupation germinated outside of Haiti. In the British Caribbean, the view was that occupation presented a rare opportunity for Haiti to advance materially, to achieve more structurally a modernity that had eluded other parts of the region. This was blind confidence that the apparatus for this remarkable growth would be developed by the Marines. And it's important to note here that at this very early stage, in the early in the uh, 20th century, there was a lingering notion among elites in the Caribbean uh, that some elites, that U.S. Uh, connections, uh, tighter U.S. connections, could actually improve 
the welfare and the economy of the region. <clears throat> The capitalist, the capitalist will go to Haiti for Haiti's eventual good, stated a Jamaican editorial in August 1915. And in a few years' time, that country should have strikingly developed. And ten years hence, the Black Republic may be counted as a prosperous and progressive country. End quote. The Haitian-American Treaty, signed the following month, was regarded by proponents of occupation as sealing the future of Haiti. Whatever the negatives of a foreign presence, the gains would be far more significant for the once troubled country. Such a perspective could not rationalize the methods of marine rule. As is now well known, resistance to the occupation emerged almost immediately. Peasant forces joined the Cacos under the leadership of Charmain Peralt and organized a consistent battle against the abuses of the Marines. These abuses did not take long to surface. The wanton violence toward Haitian peasants, peasants intensified once the Marine forces were faced with resistance. The stories of this aspect, the more impacting outcome of the occupation, did not travel easily. A systematic control of the Haitian press and news of what obtained in Haiti was imposed immediately. To the extent that Haiti's neighbors knew of, this, of these reports, invariably, sorry, to the extent that Haiti's neighbors knew of this, the reports invariably reflected U.S. propaganda. The Cacos were bandits a counter-progressive auxiliary force bent on keeping Haiti in the darker stages of its 19th century politics. The Marines were doing their part in quelling the inherent violence and making peace prevail finally in Haiti. So total was the acceptance of this narrative in the first two years of the occupation that one scarcely finds any dissenting voice outside of Haiti. What accounts for this limited British Caribbean interest in Haiti in these early years of occupation? It was not only because of an acceptance of the permanence of U.S. imperialism, it was more a result of a more deeply registered reality for British Caribbeans and Americans too, the Great War. It is difficult to discuss the U.S. occupation of Haiti in its earliest stages without attention to the major conflict that was simultaneously occurring in Europe. For the British Caribbean, the Great War, World War I, stirred patriotism and strengthened the bonds of empire. A century ago, in November 1915, people across the British Islands joined long lines to volunteer to serve in the British West Indian Regiment to dedicate their lives for king and empire on the front lines of Europe. The conflict and the Caribbean participation in it drew attention away from the occupation. The Great War, in some ways, also facilitated the method of occupation. Great Britain and France, both with interest in the Caribbean, were less able to address the occupation's violations when faced with the war. And the same was true in Jamaica, which up until recently had been closely following events in Haiti. While British Caribbeans began training operations, the US Marines were slashing and burning their way across the Haitian countryside in search of cacos. A Haitian opponent of the occupation, who visited Jamaica, put the point very well in an article that appeared in a daily paper. Quote, I say, the revolution of 1915 is not the cause of the occupation of Haiti. If so, why is it that the Americans do not occupy Mexico? No foreigners have ever been molested in Haiti. It is a well-known fact that Haiti, on account of its geographical situation, has always been coveted. My opinion is the opinion of all sensible people that the Great War gave to the Americans the best opportunity to occupy Haiti and take by force what the Haitians have been doing 25 years, refusing to grant what no American money, no American diplomacy could achieve. This opportunity was not lost. They were to interfere in our political affairs at that moment, whether the revolution of 1915 took place or not." End quote. It is debatable whether the British government would have objected to the occupation were it not for the Great War. But there is another issue, though, that is worth pointing out. News of what was happening in Haiti was beginning to get beyond marine censorship more widely by 1917. In the United States, the press, particularly an investigative uh, series of articles by The Nation, investigated and looked closely at the occupation. These stories were picked up by Caribbean papers. Jamaican newspapers then registered shock at the details of the occupation. Having previously praised the potential of the occupation, a more sober evaluation began to emerge. Here's an assessment from a Jamaican daily from 1917. Quote, 
In these days, we hardly give a thought to Haiti, though that island is but next door to us. We know exactly that it is now in the control of America, and that for some little time we have heard of no revolutions there. That is about the sum of our knowledge. But we are rather surprised to read that as a preliminary to change, about 1,000 Haitians had to be killed. End quote. The outside image of the occupation started to change, and as it changed, there emerged a new emphasis on its violence. Even as British Caribbeans came to terms with the loss of life of their countrymen in the Great War, those who paid attention to Haiti had to come to terms with the ugliness of the occupation. By 1919, when the Second Cacao War had been viciously put down and the surviving Caribbean soldiers returned home that same year, a different view of the occupation began to set in. This view of the U.S. presence, as dangerous and violent, was sharpened by two sources. The stories of Haitians who traveled to Jamaica, and many of these stories were reprinted in the press. Some of them wrote letters and articles themselves, mostly about the atrocities in Haiti under the occupation. And the attention given to the U.S. Senate inquiry into the occupation, which was held in 1921. Both were cru crucial, as they were first-hand testimonies of what had prevailed in Haiti since 1915. In Jamaica, some of these stories were editorialized in the papers. It is worth considering the weight of these accounts. A few examples will do. The campaign against the Cacos in the town of Ensch was notoriously brutal. There, U.S. marine abuse ran the gamut from home invasions to torture, rape, and murder. One witness, a woman named Exil on Exil, who testified at the inquiry, gave testimony of her husband being strung up by the rafters of their house and then burned alive there. In Saint-Marc, there were several testimonies of prisoners, such as Polydor Saint-Pierre, who was tied up and beaten for hours before being forced, force fed boiling water from a kerosene can. Another witness, a French priest from Tomazo, was correct when he stated to the commission that Haitians had, by 1920, lost all confidence in the occupation. As the ventilation of these stories widened, so too did vocal Haitian resistance. The Union Patriotique, which had among its founders future President Stenio Vincent, issued a memorial calling for the immediate withdrawal of the U.S. troops and reparations to the Haitian people for the injuries they had endured. Regional defenders of the occupation were hard-pressed to maintain their position when presented with such an overwhelming catalogue of abuses. The violence in Ench, Saint-Marc, Port-Prince, cap -Aïtien, the censorship of the press, the arrest of its editors, the marginalization of local politicians, the revision of Haitian policy, all of this was fresh in the minds of a Jamaican public. But so too were the horrors of July 1915, the revolutions that preceded them, the exiles, and the persistent sense of instability in preoccupation Haiti. What was the future of, ha of occupied Haiti in the 1920s? How much longer would the occupation last? As ever, opinions were divided. A lengthy editorial in the Jamaican Daily Gleaner titled America and Haiti considered these perspectives. Quote, what is the truth about American administration in Haiti? On the one hand, we have statements in the American press which are startling. On the other hand, we have official assertions which are intended to be thoroughly reassuring. The paper further explained that what was needed was more vigilant observation of the Marines in Haiti rather than complete withdrawal. If the occupation was to end, the editor feared, quote, there is no reason whatever to believe that the Haitians, if left to themselves, would not continue to retrograde, end quote. This discussion over the occupation and its course by the beginning of the 1920s at it occurred at a time when there was a revival of discussions in the British Caribbean about the U.S. presence. Given the weight of the United States in most of the islands, the colonies of Great Britain wandered about their destiny. British Caribbean writers such as Jamaican Louis Meikle wrote of the need for a Caribbean confederation to combat the rising power of the United States. Haitian writer and thinker and politician Antino Fiamme, in one of his final Peter, uh, pieces, Letters from St. Thomas, made a parallel proposition four years before the occupation began. In the 1920s, however, when the excitement of the Great War had settled, the issue lingered. An argument returned that the United States would connect feeble Caribbean economies to its large markets and by so doing stimulate growth and production. The Haitian experience was deployed in such debates. Advocates of this view held that after some reforms, 
the occupation would put the Republic on a prosperous path. That in spite of the violence, Haiti had material benefits, peace, improved roads, and opportunities. There were defenders of the British Empire in the British Islands who also used Haiti as evidence of the opposite view. A 1924 editorial in a Jamaican paper noted, quote, when some persons in this island talk about the wonders that the United States would do for the British West Indies, we immediately want to know something about the wonders that the United States has accomplished for Puerto Rico or Haiti. Under the stars and stripes, they see the stars and feel the stripes." End quote. Francois Lamotte, a Haitian visiting Jamaica in the middle of the 1920s, made a similar comment. Quote, I shiver when I hear some Jamaicans express a desire to see Jamaica become an American possession. They believe that Jamaica will be transformed into vast industrial fields in a short time. Poor things. I would like them to witness what Americans are doing in Haiti, which has been plunged into the greatest depths of misery and despair." End quote. Yet even if there was disagreement over the suitability of U.S. control in the English-speaking islands, there remained a more universal view that foreign control should continue in Haiti. And this in spite of intensified Haitian resistance against the occupiers by the end of the 1920s. The 1929 general strike that ignited a widespread public outcry against occupation in Haiti and also in the United States had a more mixed result in Jamaica. In the United States, the events of 1929 to 1930 led to the Forbes Commission's investigation of the occupation. The resulting report of 1930 accepted a view that, quote, race antipathies lie behind many of the difficulties which the United States military and civil forces have met in Haiti, end quote. The recommendation of the, of the uh, Forbes Commission was to end marine control of Haiti. In Jamaica, publicity of these events and the report led the papers to arrive at the conclusion that the occupation was a failure, that nothing worthwhile had come of it after 15 years. Still, there was still a view that some kind of foreign presence was necessary in Haiti, lest the country relapse into its preoccupation state. A Jamaican reporter went so far as to suggest in an article that marine withdrawal would be unfair to Haiti as it would show the world that Haitians were unable to rule themselves. Ultimately, the fundamental problem with the occupation, Jamaican papers argued, was that it was done by the United States, an inexperienced imperial power. The United States had no proper appreciation of what was required to build administrative structures in a Caribbean country. The US, this writer uh, opined, this is a writer in the paper, always wanted to do things quickly. And here's a quote. The Americans are a hustling race and have to put a time limit to their endeavors. The writer granted that the occupation had some tangible benefits, roads, sanitation, and education. But these, he suggested, would be more fully appreciated by future generations. The generation of the occupation, the generation of the 1920s and 1930s, will remember it only for its violence and racism. The root problem was that the American occupiers believed that in 20 years, Haiti could have been wholly transformed. This was completely misleading, according to the writer. Quote, 15 or 20 years of what really amounts to extraneous government cannot counterbalance the influence of a century of internal revolutions. End quote. The model for effective foreign administration of a Caribbean nation was, according to this writer, laid by the British, not the United States. Here the author revived the debate over British versus US rule. He imagined a possible alternative for Haiti in 1915, one in which the British, undistracted by the Great War, intervened. According to the writer, the British would not have set about the task of establishing limits, understanding fully well that careful administration takes time. A resident officer or governor would, would have been appointed. The British would have been far more just with the Haitians who resisted having already their own tropical possessions of long standing. They would have involved more Haitians in administration, and the children of Haiti, according to the writer, would grow up to feel themselves attached to Great Britain, as opposed to the resentment that they felt for the United States. In short, Haiti would resemble the British islands. This was not an altogether new proposition, since at least the 1870s, elites in both the British Caribbean and in Haiti conjectured that the Republic would be better served if it was annexed to the British Empire and avoided the approach of the United States. 
Indeed, uh, sometime in the 1880s, a group of Haitian elites wrote a letter uh, to, to the British uh, uh, colonial office requesting some form of intervention and some sort of um, control. And there were also similar uh, letters that were sent to France at the same time. Yet then and in 1930, such imaginations were fantasy. There were also thinly disguised prejudices against Haiti and its ability to remain independent. What was clearly evident after the Forbes Commission was that British Caribbean commenters had no more faith in the U.S. occupation, even if they remained skeptical about Haiti's future. These two points contributed to renewed interest in Haiti in the 1930s. In Trinidad, this interest was registered in articles and debates over the future of the region. A 1930 debate that raged in the pages of the Beacon, a large literary journal, referenced Haiti. One writer praised Haitian independence, and another claimed that whatever gains Haiti had made since 1804, they were due entirely to the United States. The image of occupied Haiti also emerged in British Caribbean literature of the decade, usually with unflattering depictions of the United States. Esther Hyman, an English woman who became a very well-known writer in Jamaica, where she had settled, visited Haiti in 1934, and she wrote several articles and stories with Haitian themes. One such, called Modern Young Woman, revolved around two British sisters. One married a high-ranking U.S. Army official and left with him for his post in Haiti. When her sister visited her there, she discovered her sister was ensnared in a world of decadence and abuse. The Marines do not come off well in this tale, nor does Haiti under their rule. Hyman's depiction of the general view of the occupation in Jamaica matched that of their Haitian counterparts that the occupation was, in full measure, a largely unsuccessful enterprise. More than this, it was a source of resentment and ridicule. The opposing views of the benefits of U.S. military presence in Haiti had narrowed, and so by 1934, nationalists and defenders of empire alike joined with Haitians in celebrating its end. In the 1930s, a new generation was emergent, one that had no solid memories of the pre-1915 years. What they embraced instead about Haiti were the promises of new president, Stenion Vincent, and once again the example of Haitian independence. When Vincent visited Jamaica in 1933, he was feted and hailed as a rescuer of Haiti from the throes of U.S. occupation. The occupation had carried on for so long that, in its, initial that its initial purpose had become lost, subsumed under a near universal hatred for it. The Jamaican press, long ambivalent about Haiti's ability to govern itself, chaired the final withdrawal of Marines in August 1934. The legacies of the 19-year rule would naturally register strongest for Haiti. They also had deep cultural and political echoes for the United States, as historian Mary Render has shown in her book, Taking Haiti. But what sort of lasting effect did it have for Haiti's neighbors? My discussion this morning has attempted to show that Haiti under U.S. occupation was at times placed at the center of early debates about the possibilities of the post-colonial future of the Caribbean. My discussion has been from the vantage point of the English-speaking Caribbean in the occupation years and seeks to open up another way of viewing the U.S. occupation of Haiti, one that I hope is of relevance to, to today's symposium. The other examples of U.S. occupation in the Caribbean that my colleagues will be exploring today, Trinidad in the 40s and Grenada in the 80s, focus on English-speaking islands. The greater point, I imagine, is that we can find connections between the U.S. occupations in all these cases. Importantly, my discussion was intended to say something about the English-speaking Caribbean and its views of U.S. occupation in its earlier stages, as it was to treat the Haitian case. By so doing, I believe we can show that taking Haiti out of the more familiar comparisons of occupation, Cuba, the South and Central American republics, we can remind ourselves of the particularity of U.S. Caribbean occupation. In so doing, striking similarities can be examined. It seems to me that there is much that can be said about the parallels between what happened in Port-au-Prince in July 1915 and what happened in Fort Rupert in Grenada in October 1983. In both instances, U.S. occupation followed the murder of a head of state. But we cannot look at these cases only as reflections of one another, for to do that we'll miss an equally fundamental point, that as a region evolved, the modes of U.S. occupation also matured. 
At each stage of its development, there was a pro process of learning and unlearning of the experiences of previous interventions in the Caribbean. In different ways, the legacies of the three examples we'll be discussing today, Haiti, uh, Haiti, Grenada, and Trinidad, haunt their countries to this day. In Haiti, it resonate, resonates sharply as the country is still dealing with a foreign military presence. From the distance of 100 years, perhaps we can see that the long history of American occupations in the Caribbean was more than the sum of its parts. It was a historical shift in the order of things. In that shift, the definition of empire was reinscribed on the islands in ways few could fathom in 1915. This is both past and present for the region, which as a whole is still adjusting to the effects of physical and non-physical foreign occupation. Thank you. I think a way to answer that is to sort of break it down. Uh, there's a cultural impact as well as a political, uh, social, and economic. I think generally, if you think of the first one I mentioned, culture, there has been a sense in which, um, if, you go, if we're talking about the occupation of 1915 to 1934, it did lead to a sort of rejection of American culture uh, as part of the resentment, which I explained in my presentation. Uh, politically, though, it had very strong uh, resonances later on. One of the ma main issues was how the political arrangements in Haiti were reordered under the occupation. Uh, certain elites were put in charge uh, as, as government leaders and state leaders. And what would happen was that they were, and the military, of course, was strengthened. That was a major thing. The, the gendarmerie, which was uh, developed on, on the marine rule, eventually evolved into the guard d'Haïti, which was closely allied with the Haitian state and became a sort of instrument for, um, for state repression in many instances. And so that was clearly a legacy of the occupation. And that led in 1946 to a sort of popular uprising in Haiti uh, against those legacies. Uh, there's also a legacy in terms of issues of color in Haiti, which is a major issue, particularly during the mid 20th century, where the occupations uh, seem to elevate persons of lighter skin uh, complexion to positions of political power. And that led to a reaction, a very strong reaction on the part of uh, darker skinned political elites, which was also enveloped in that, that movement of 1946 that I just mentioned. So those are long-term sorts of consequences uh, that, that happen. But again, one of the things we should bear in mind is that Haiti goes through all of these different stages in the 20th century. And so by the time we get to the Duvalier dictatorship in 1957, we get into a more authoritarian, tyrannical form of rule uh, that in some ways was actually facilitated by the political aftermath of occupation. Noirism was a, one of the political ideas that I had mentioned just now in that response, and it was a very strong one in Haiti in the period of the 1930s and 40s. Essentially, it means rule, or interpreted in the Haitian case, uh, rule of the state by a representative most closely res uh, connected or resembling the majority population, hence dark-skinned elites, political elites. Now, it had a history long before that. It had a, a history going back to the 19th century. But its reinterpretation in the post-occupation period is very significant because in some ways it's a reaction to the way in which the politics had been arranged uh, during the occupation. And it becomes widespread. It's a, it's a, it's ideas that develop among a certain elite class in Haiti, writers, thinkers, people like uh, Francois Duvalier uh, as a student, and then it expands and becomes more popular among uh, labor leaders, uh, political um, you know, spokespeople and advocates and so on. And so the 1946 revolution, as it was called uh, at the time, was also seen as a noirist revolution. It was a revolution uh, uh, that in which uh, people who saw themselves, political elites who saw themselves as uh, better able to rule Haiti uh, took control of the state. And um, that was a major transformation. And then Duvalier himself would, would, would claim that. He would claim that he was a Norris president and what he was doing was for the benefit of the majority population in Haiti. So it, it, that idea itself evolves and becomes sort of subsumed on the broader uh, type of rule that is more more appropriately termed Duvalierism, which really isn't Noirism when Duvalier takes it over. You know, Noirism is 
there are elements of it in his rule, but fundamentally he creates something else and uses Noirism as a justification for, for his tyranny. But also we could add to that the geopolitical issues, which is a major issue, uh, especially during the time of the First World War. So there was concern about German presence in the Caribbean, and that was always a motivating factor from even before uh, we get to 1915. Uh, some of the examples I read earlier uh, sort of indicated that there, was, there would be an inevitability to U.S. occupation, that at some point the United States is definitely going to go into Haiti uh, because of that strategic uh, issue. But to come back to your question though, about race, uh, I hope I made clear in the presentation that that wasn't just an issue that, that was held in the United States, that even among Haiti's Caribbean neighbors, there was a sense that Haiti was unable to rule itself. That even if they were critical of the United States and the way in which that occupation unfolded, and they were highly critical from a perspective <coughs> of a, a group that very much cleaved tightly to British imperialism as opposed to US imperialism, uh, there was still this fundamental sense, even when faced with all of these examples of the violence and, and, and the repression and the censorship and the martial law, uh, that, that Haiti couldn't rule itself. As I said, one, one reporter said that if the United States pull out, it would be an embarrassment to Haiti because the rest of the world will, will, will realize that the U.S., sorry, that Haitians couldn't rule themselves. So what they were advocating for some time was a modification of the occupation until they sort of, you know, came up with the view or, or, or the conclusion that the United States was, was not able to properly uh, rule Haiti. Which is very interesting because if you think some of those debates are, are things that would recur later on in the 20th century, particularly when you talk about U.S. presence in Haiti, uh, at various moments when you see that happening, uh, particularly uh, with the, um, the, after the, um, the overthrow of Aristide the first time in 1991 and, and the return of Aristide in 95 with U.S. troops coming in. Uh, and then again in 04 with the second overthrow of Aristide and you had Minusta, the foreign presence, coming in. There's always this sense that, that there's a, an aspect of the, of, of the way in which that the occupations are set up, constructed, that are fundamentally flawed in these, in these issues, in, in these specific cases. Uh, of, of um, episodes of disorder in Haiti. Um, I think now what has been happening, and it's actually before sort of uh, the earthquake with MINUSTA, this idea of a sort of uh, a coalition government, a, a force, military force, coming into Haiti uh, and ruling there. And so there is that sense for sure that in terms of the military forces on the ground, it's this coalition force. But po in terms of policy, who is directing policy, there is, of course, a sense that the United States still dominates the affairs in Haiti. Look at what's happening now in Haiti with the elections. Uh, there is this, this, this standoff between the rival candidates, and, and some are protesting and saying that they are not going to uh, support the runoff in December. And, and there's this, still this, this notion that the interference of the United States, the so-called international community, which the United States has allowed its voice, that there is a sense that that is still a, a, a fundamental um, guide to how things will happen. So, so I would say that, that there, there, these are ongoing discussions that, that you know, constantly emerge. And, and the occupation, the end of the, 19, the, the, the 1915 to 34 occupation didn't mean an end to U.S. presence and um, you know, sort of involvement in Haitian politics. It didn't. I mean, the United States remained very much involved in what was happening in, in Haiti after that, even if they were not uh, physically occupying. Effectively, yes. I mean, effectively, that, I think that was the idea behind the comment that, uh, that the United States you know, was indeed uh, the, rule, you know, the ruler of Haiti, uh, even though you had Haitians in, in state positions. So um, yes, that's definitely how critics saw it, for sure. But as I was saying, this, this view also meant that it was, it was a belief that fundamentally Haitian politics had failed and that some sense of foreign presence was needed. In fact, uh, there was too, I, I didn't mention it in the paper, but there was another view too, which interestingly, and this connects to the previous question, which interestingly advocated a, a form of coalition foreign military presence in Haiti uh, that said that, you know, 
Haiti needed a foreign presence, but left to the United States alone in charge, it wasn't going to work. But if the United States, Britain, and France went in, then perhaps something more meaningful could come out of it. This is going all the way back to the early 20th century. People were making these views. There was, um, there was a, a debate for sure that, that Haiti, in fact, before the occupation, the debate was a question of annexation. Uh, would Haiti be annexed to the United States? Uh, what would it look like? Uh, and that wasn't very much settled uh, by the time the Marines went in. In fact, when they arrived, they didn't know how long the occupation would last. They came because of a political crisis. That was the, the sort of moment that allowed for intervention. But in terms of how that op occupation would take shape, how long, that was still unsettled. So it had been a gradual process of withdrawal. The Forbes Commission uh, recommended gradual withdrawal. So the last group of Marines left in, in 34. Not really. In fact, in the run-up to it, there was, the British had, in the 19th century, a very strong presence in Haiti, uh, a very important one. Uh, bear in mind that official US recognition of Haiti as an independent state didn't come about till the Civil War here. Uh, so the British had done so. It was actually the um, second country to recognize Haitian independence after France in the 1820s. Uh, by the time you get to the early 20th century, British uh, officials in Haiti keep saying that the Americans are using uh, naval power to assert their, their, uh, their might in the region. And so, you know, they were patrolling Port-au-Prince Harbor in, in naval ships. Uh, so there was a sense in which it was almost competitive in a way, uh, which, which group, uh, you know, was going to sort of dominate. In fact, in 1911, there was a major political crisis in Haiti, and the British foreign minister in Haiti uh, wrote to England saying, what am I to do? The Americans have increased the number of ships in the harbor, and they've come to us saying that they're willing to intervene if necessary, and then, you know, if we need their help, and they're basically saying, no, we, we don't. Um, so that, you know, that idea of there, there was this moment in which it would actually happen, uh, and so 1915 presents that moment. Uh, but in terms of, of some sort of collaboration or discussion with other, other foreign powers of how to do it, that wasn't really happening. And a lot of the, the interest first develops through finance, finances, right? U.S. participation in the Haitian National Bank and the dominance there uh, was really, really crucial. I have looked at some of the testimonies on the Duvalier, and, and you do see similarities in terms of uh, Makut brutality, uh, particularly in the countryside and what that meant for people there. So th there is, of course, that, uh, you know, that argument. I've also seen testimonies from 19th century political uprisings in Haiti, uh, nothing on the scale of what would uh, be reported. And of course, a lot of those inquiries were not as extensive as the inquiry in, in 1920 uh, to 2021. But you do see that. I mean, and there is this, this, this sort of narrative of violence, right, that runs through all of this uh, in Haiti. Uh, and, and I think also, you know, Warren's close study in itself, really. I mean, how does this violence sort of uh, re-emerge at different points in time? Uh, how is it reimagined, and how are the tools of violence redeployed by different groups at different moments? There's a lot of good scholarship that examines the way in which U.S. Marines uh, documented their experiences in Haiti. And for most of them, many of them, it was the first time they had left the United States. And they left the United States with instructions about, you know, this is a, a, a military move to restore order and peace in this country. But then, you know, it's a, it's a very different experience for them on the ground. Uh, everything from the climate to the language to, to the, you know, the politics to the geography, all of that is, is, is remarkable adjustment. And I think that makes it a, a very distinct from... from um, you know, the north, northern soldiers in the south.